Hi, you're watching TheAnalysis.News, and I'm your host, Talia Baroncelli. You're watching part two of my discussion with French-Palestinian sociologist Sari Hanafi. We'll be debating the terms far right and far left within the context of French and European politics. If you'd like to support us, you can go to our website, TheAnalysis.News, hit the donate button at the top right corner of the screen, and make sure you're on our mailing list. That way you get a notification via email every time a new episode is published. See you in a bit with Sari Hanafi. I'm very happy to be joined by Dr. Sari Hanafi. He is a professor of sociology at the American University of Beirut and is the director of the Center of Arab and Middle Eastern Studies. He is also French of Palestinian origin, and he recently finished writing a book on the crisis of liberal democracy. The book is called Against Symbolic Liberalism, A Plea for Dialogic Sociology. So thank you so much for joining me again, Sari. Uh, uh, thank you, Talia. Pleasure to be with you. I still have a few questions because at the beginning you were saying that you wouldn't use the term far right for the national rally. And of course, you've already mentioned that the founder of the party, which was originally the National Front, Jean-Marie Le Pen, comes from a very sort of fascist tradition. But then his daughter, Marine Le Pen, tried to extricate the party from that history, tried to call the party neither left nor right, but more nationalist or populist. Um, and a lot of people, if you just you know read YouTube comments, they, they say that this isn't the far right. This is just, you know, young people trying to um, protect French culture or French heritage. So before we get to the far left or that term, the far left, why would you say the far right isn't exactly the right descriptor? Because if you're looking at if you're saying that the, the I guess, majority espouse these values, then yes, maybe things the discourse are sh is potentially shifting to the right. But if you look at things objectively, then the rational rally still does represent far right values, does it not? Yeah, so this is a very good question. Actually, in the last, uh, if you like, 15 years, you have so much literature that a left right divide doesn't have much meaning today to understand how people make their moral reasoning and justifications and how they behave. Mm -hmm. So it's not uh, anymore. Uh, if you like, you don't have a, a clear cut right wing values and left wing values, if you like, or even political policies. Mm -hmm. You see with how the convergence between Social Democrat and Christian Democrat in many, many countries in Europe and elsewhere. So if you like, the argument I bring is simply the following, that often the word far uh, represent the meaning that is in the margin of the political spectrum. This is the mean far. I mean, you have the center, you have left and right, and then you have the extremity, far right and far left. Now, the problem, if this far right or far left become majoritarians, in that case, the word far doesn't have much meaning. This is what I'm trying to say. Having said that, it's exactly like, look, the clear cases, Trump, Trump definitely, who is the Nicholas with whom Trump created his first group is the Tea Party in the United States. And the Tea Party in the United States, it's by excellent, is a far right. Is the Republican is right, the Democrat is left, and the far right. But then this Tea Party today is inherent part of the Republicans. There is no Tea Party anymore, by the way. So they really assimilated within this uh, Republican Party. So I can describe some of the policy of this party as a fascist, as authoritarian, populist, with a specific meaning, what the meaning populist, if you like. I think for me, Macron and National Rally, both are populist party. So you see, and again, Macron is in the center. So exactly populist has a specific meaning in political science. And I use it not as insult, as really when you create a movement outside of the establishment where you have a program where you say all the politics is shit except my politics. This is, if you like, uh, this is a populism. So I keep this word far, if you like, as a kind of a quantitative measurement. But even not using the word 
far right doesn't mean you agree with this or you see that they, these people say, look, I am sensitive to this because I know the, the power of the labeling. And I see in the Arab world, for instance, how you vilify a political party, you say this is Islamist. And then it means that should not be in governed. And, and in the past, you talk the same thing about communists as radical. as So I'm, I'm very careful not to use this uh, kind of label as a label. But analytically and descriptively, I can really be very harsh. I mean, Giorgia Miloni, it's a very interesting. I have a conversation a few days ago with a friend, with Italian political scientist, and he told me that the Italian media, they don't talk anymore about Giorgia Miloni, if you like, political party or group as a far right wing. They are majoritarian, they win uh, uh, the election. But having said that, we can criticize uh, Giorgia Miloni. When you see the populism against uh, migration, some uh, of her policy, economic policy, foreign policy, we can do it, if you like. But I'm not sure the world now today uh, to say Giorgia Miloni is a far right has much meaning. I see what you mean by, by not trivializing that word far right, because if you throw it around too much, then it could lose its impact just as, you know, if you throw around the word anti-Semitism too much, it also loses its value. But I think there are perhaps two things to um, distinguish here, and that's the people who actually vote for these parties. Not all of them themselves are racist or far right. A lot of them are people who have been, you know, disillusioned by the establishment, by the elite. They don't have good jobs. They're affected by all sorts of um, outside economic factors, maybe the pension reform is very important to them, and the cost of living crisis, inflation, all of these things have pushed them to see things through a lens of migration and to just blame, um, you know, people coming in from other countries and, and to scapegoat those individuals and to not see the real culprits who are the elite financiers, in other words, Macron's, you know, financial elite. So, Perhaps the, the voters of these far right parties are not necessarily all far right themselves, but they're being preyed upon and they're leaning more towards the right because the left is maybe not presenting an attractive political platform to them. But back to Maloney's case. So Giorgia Maloney in Italy, she's the leader of the Fratelli d'Italia, the um, Brothers of, of Italy. And there was actually a recent investigation which did spark a discussion about the far right in Italy, it, if I can just briefly mention this, it was um, an investigation led by an investigative outlet called fanpage.it. And they went uh, undercover and they attended several meetings of Maloney's youth group called uh, Giovanni Meloniana. And in this youth group, they made all sorts of recordings showing um, people in this youth group, you know, anywhere between the ages of 14 to 32, saying things like Sieg Heil, the infamous uh, Nazi statement and also Duce Duce referring to Mussolini, but also saying things like Jews are of a different race, that they're of a completely different race from white people, that, you know, that black people are of a different race. So they were making explicitly anti-Semitic statements. Um, and there were people from her political party, Fratelli d'Italia, actually present at a lot of these meetings. So I think what this signifies is that the far right and their ideology is actually becoming more accepted and more visible. And so these people are not as afraid to attend these sorts of meetings anymore. And it's it's gaining sort of political currency. And this did actually unleash a sort of discussion around the far right in Italy. But what's interesting is that Maloney did not address this particular investigation in Italy itself. She did say that it was a hit job, but she only addressed it when pressed by reporters in Brussels saying that she wouldn't accept nostalgic or anti-Semitic statements from within her party. So I think that that does indicate that she does espouse these far right values and people within her party do, but that it's not really playing out that way and that the narrative has shifted so far to the right that to call it far right almost seems redundant. Yeah. Thank you for bringing this. Look, my position is the following. I don't mind after decomposition that you have recomposition and using a certain vocabulary, but you need to do your homework. And this is exactly, I think, how the reporter you talk about did this by investigating what kind of vocabulary, what kind of doctrine is stored within uh, the Francia Italia uh, party and others. 
And really for me, the big lesson I learned from a book called Stranger in Their Own Land is an ethnographical work with the Tea Party group done by a famous American sociologist, Arnie Horschild. Arnie Horschild spent time with the Tea Party supporter to realize that some of their claims are really a leftist claim, historically. I mean, they are not in favor that to let the big capitals, if they find that they win more money on uh, moving a car factory from United States to, let's say, Thailand, uh, Vietnam, they will do it. Okay, that they said, no, we need some role of the state as a regulatory of the private property and etc. So if you like, and they realize, and she realized that they said, Democrat, they didn't do it. And some of this Tea Party supporter come from Democrat historically. They are a white working class that history devoted for the Democrat. So you see that we need to do this decomposition, this analysis before we decide where this party situate themselves. I think if you like, Georgia Meloni, it's part of a coalition, a worldwide coalition called National Conservatism. And you have a foundation called Perk uh, Foundation. It's a famous uh, British right-wing philosopher. It's a national conservatism foundation headed by a former advisor of Netanyahu, by the way, a kind of uh, uh, Israeli-American uh, guy, very right-wing. And Georgia Miloni was giving a keynote five years ago in their convention. And you see, Miloni, what kind of agenda, values, uh, social values, economic values, political values uh, she has. And some of them really alarming, if you like. Some of them, it's uh, conservative, as simple as that. I mean, today there is a feeling of some people that the liberal, they are imposing their conception of the good on society. They want to change curriculum in schools, about controversial issues, for instance, in the name of non-discrimination against LGBTQ+. Plus, we want to propagate the idea of gender fluidity. It's very interesting in the discourse of Georgia Miloni five years ago, I would not qualify it as a homophobic, although I know that within her political party rank, people are homophobic. But her agenda, social agenda, our family agenda, in a very careful way. So uh, uh, she is not in favor of discriminating against any sexual orientation. But she is saying that me, I have a certain value where I believe the heteronormativity is the good path for me, for instance. But I'm not discriminating against others. And this is part of my book, if you like, uh, against uh, symbolic liberalism, is to show that if we are not careful to distinguish between the conception of justice, Mm -hmm. where society should agree on it, and it's clearly to be aligned with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, that there is no discrimination on the basis of gender, race, sexual orientation, uh, even social class, etc., Okay, this is should be kept like a Bible while allow the plurality of the conception of the good. And this is, uh, if you like, the basic of political liberalism of John Rawls, that the conception of the good, the way I want to live, what I want to dress, how I want to swim, what kind of food I will eat. This conception of the good life or the good, this is a, should be pluralistic and should be kept pluralistic. When this the conception of the good enter into conflict with other conception of the good, which is always the case, if you like. I mean, what kind of visibility for naked people, for LGBTQ, for uh, whether we will uh, ban uh, to eat meat uh, today? You know, some of the uh, radical uh, vegetarian or or veggie group, they are in favor of, of banning this and so on. So when the conception of the good enter into conflict in society, we should be sure that there is sufficiently discussion in society and not to be imposed from above, and specifically using the schools as a proxy of the state choice, if you like, or or the elite in the power, if you like. So this kind of issue that today 
which really make some people move to the right because of the cultural left abuse their position and they actually they forgot the social justice and the social class analysis. And they are not anymore talking about social class. They are really interested in more cultural claims about a specific issue, uh, sexual orientation, about culture, about art. And, and people become, their secularism become anti-clericalist against the religion instead of just to, to, to say we need a, a safe distance between politics and religion, between the state and religion. And instead of this, they become anti-clericalist. And in that case, what happened? That population moved to the right. Hungarian started to vote for Orban and things like that. So if we don't be careful about our liberalism, the left, and I come from the left, I, I do this like a, a self-criticism of my uh, political group. If we don't be careful about that, we are sure that less and less we will win the election. To pick up on your point about Maloney, I mean, she, the way that she frames things is, you know, she says God, homeland, and family. So she's presenting it in such a way that might not appear to be homophobic to some people, but it's still, it's still laying out the playing field for who is considered to be a good member of society and who isn't. And I think she's drawing a line there. And if you look at some of the legislation that she supports, she would not support where her party does not support the Didi Ozan legislation, which would, in fact, make any sort of crimes against people who are LGBTQ an aggravating circumstance of that crime. So it, it, they're trying to water down or not recognize crimes that are motivated by LGBTQ hatred as being an aggravating circumstance. But I think it's the right moment now to talk about the left, as I think we can both... Um, argue that we both identify as being as part of the left. And so what does that even mean to be on the left? If you look at the French parties, for example, Jean-Luc Mélenchon's party, they're called the extreme left or the far left. What does that mean? Is that something based on an objective assessment or is that something that's just kind of blown out of proportion in, in the media? I mean, if they're really far left, they wouldn't be in any sort of position to govern. They probably wouldn't be accepted at all within a, a sort of uh, left-wing coalition. Um, but based on your also your arguments here about a pluralistic society, how do we assess the left and also its potential failures by focusing in certain instances just on cultural issues and not on economic issues? I need to open two brackets and then I will go back to, uh, I will come uh, to your question. But this is my point that if you like somebody who say, look, in Italy, if you like uh, a very Catholic country, okay, uh, and and people culturally Christian, I mean, or Catholic, it's that doesn't mean that they go to the church, etc. Cetera, et cetera. But culturally, if you say, uh, if you come as a politician uh, with the motto, God, homeland, and family, I, I think uh, she's still within a liberal framework. I mean, she has the right to say, look, for me, I appreciate a God, family for me, it's important, Italy as a nation, is a now, where we can see uh, when she departure from liberalism exactly with the example you brought, but I will not consider anyone who think that family is important to be one of the devices in politics that something wrong. Because, Talia, why I am saying this? Because I am very serious today. Today, with the neoliberalism, individual is left to know nowhere in the front of this wide market, okay? So family is very important. And, and if you keep undermining family authority, this really will have consequences. I mean, look to the amazing, beautiful welfare state, Sweden, which the state is take care of everything. It's the highest uh, suicide rate there. It's, they have a... Uh, now, uh, very soon, they will vote and allow uh, to lower what they ca call the criminal age. They wanted to make it 14 instead of 16. So at age of 14, if you commit, uh, if, if, you, uh, if you sell drugs, etc., you will go to prison and you will not go, go to Genovile institution. 
an educational institution. So you see, I mean, we should admit that that we are in real crisis. That we we, we need to think uh, what what happened with the family uh, uh, value. And again, when I say family values or family authority, I am not chanting for traditional family. I I know how historically uh, uh, a traditional family has has a patriarcha, etc. But I think if some group will say, look, wait a minute, there is more and more laws, uh, more and more imposing conception of the good against family, uh, 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 if you like, uh, authorities, uh, some group is saying this, uh, I think they have the right. Uh, they, they have the right within the liberal framework. This is, if you like, what I'm trying to say. And then we should scrutinize exactly as you did and uh, and it's very alarming how they are issuing a new policy uh, this uh, in Italy for us, mm-hmm. okay? Which I consider this as anti-liberal, if you like, okay? So uh, we will close this. I will come now. Sorry, if I can uh, just add one last thing on that because I think this is yeah. really interesting. Of course, you know, within a pluralistic society, everyone has the right to, to speak their, their mind and also to raise the issue that perhaps their conception of a family is not being supported. But I guess the, you know, the, the culprit there is the neoliberal institutions, which are perhaps straining family values or putting additional strain on on people who are trying to, you know, have a normal working life and to support their kids. But the way that people on the far right, so Marine Le Pen's party or even Maloney, the way that they would characterize this is that the threat of against this traditional family or any sort of conception of family is actually coming from migrants and from LGBTQ people and not actually from these neoliberal institutions or from the banking elite or from these policies which are dividing people and putting these additional stresses on the family. So the way that they're using this language and this discourse is very cynical. And instead of just saying that, you know, we support family values and we want to and perhaps increase the safety net or, or, you know, social programs and a welfare system to support families, they're scapegoating other I, people as the source of the sort of threat to the family. Fully agree with you. However, my book is to look to the other side, to look how what I call those who are classically liberal, but politically liberal, if you like this cultural left, how they also have the same uh, scapegoating against migrant. Uh, I give example of the case of Sweden. In Sweden, every year you have around 5,000 kids and adolescents, I mean, less than uh, 16 years old, move from family uh, to biological family to foster family. Why? Because uh, it was some violence It's uh, for different reasons. And these 5,000 is only when we... Co- the case of compulsory uh, fostering care, it means that non-consent of uh, the, uh, the biological family. So who do this? And, and, and when you look to the statistics, you find that uh, the ratio for migrant is that three times more than non-migrant. Uh, and again, I'm talking about the Sweden because I did the research in Sweden, but uh, the Norway is the same, uh, Denmark is the same, uh, uh, in Nordic countries, if you like this, you have this uh, this kind of uh, non-respect of of uh, of the biological family. So this come from, uh, if you like, this uh, distortion of liberalism doesn't come from uh, uh, Le Pen or Meloni, if you like. So this is this is we need to be careful. I mean, all my work is to say, look, uh, the uh, how how now. Uh, human rights is eroded is not only because of this pastor uh, popular rights it's also for uh, from this another pastors which is I, I label them uh, left uh, 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 cultural left and this is maybe a very good transition to re- uh, now to reply to your question uh, after this uh, huge digression I think I think this is how Milan Shul really become very important. Mélenchon was one of, uh, of the leaders, uh, at a certain point, part of the, uh, of the Socialist Party, but 
I mean, he he uh, best off of the policy of uh, of of uh, uh, socialist party that they absolutely they are as neoliberal as uh, the re- Republicans. Mm-hmm. Uh, 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 so so and and they are not doing sufficiently work to address the uh, the horrible, uh, if you like, um, social inequalities. Uh, and uh, when I say inequalities with S, because it's about education, public uh, schooling, it's about uh, funding uh, hospitals, it's about uh, about social housing. All this is all this historically like like a very welfare state society in France is er- eroded, and and nothing. Uh, and and we we look to the Gini coefficient. This is. One indicators of uh, of uh, uh, the inequality. Uh, so we look to the to highest uh, 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 ten per, uh, twenty percent and the, the least uh, advantage twenty percent, and we see uh, uh, and 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 we calculate it. So uh, Gini coefficient is is in raise in country in the France. This is why Mélenchon become popular. Mélenchon understood. That that is a is a freak to say that the problem comes from migration. Uh, the French uh, are impoverished because there is a migrant. Uh, uh, m- maybe this contribute uh, in a ten percent of the problem, but ninety percent of the problem is really is this this uh, 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 uh policy of the state. Uh, this uh, this kind of concentration of the wealth monopolies uh, of uh, uh, of, uh, of of company. I mean, uh, uh, I do remember when I did my PhD in France uh, uh, in in uh, uh, in mid nineties or, or or actually in 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 uh, not in mid nineties in early nineties. Uh, I do remember uh, living in the suburb that I. I go and I have a convivial relationship to uh, to EPCA, what we call to the grocery uh, shop. Now, with the uh, when when the the government give uh, uh, give the possibility to uh, uh, to all, all this uh, big companies, Carrefour, Auchan, to open everywhere, uh, you kill all this lower middle class and middle class. Uh, 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 artisana, uh, if you like, petty uh, uh, bourgeoisie, if you like, in a, in a Marxist uh, language, and Mélenchon say uh, it's it's unacceptable. You need every time you have a policy to think who will be uh, uh, be, be uh, uh, harmed by this, and this is why Mélenchon become important. So uh, Mélenchon is by excellence is a phenomenon. Of redressing this cultural lift to to return to its, uh, uh, if you like, historical values, like taking care of uh, of of, of uh, uh, the inequalities within the social classes, and he did it in intersectional way. You see, when he declared his uh, uh, his uh, victory uh, as a as a group, uh, you see uh, w- what you see. You see. Uh, but black woman, you see Arab woman, uh, 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 all this is uh, refolded in uh, uh, in Macronism, in uh, in uh, ensemble, uh, uh, ensemble uh, together group, uh, where you find them all very white, and they and if you like very white, and we say no, no, we don't look to the to the race, but the the, the racial issue is there. We know that all the policy of separatist law is against the Muslim and the Arab in France, that they are stigmatized. Okay, so the same thing with with uh, uh, with Jordan uh, Bardella. Look, to when he declared the result, who is be- behind him? It's a very white, if you like. Uh, so, so this kind of things that Milan Milan should say, uh, stop lying. There is. There is a problem uh, in our society, and we need to work the social justice. So why do you say he's portrayed as such a divisive figure then, even within some groups 
among the left themselves. Dalia, the story of anti-Semitism of Milosho is out of blue. It's absolutely zero folded. This is why I, at the beginning of the interview, I told them, I told you this is exactly like what happened with Ghassan Hash. They absolutely or or with Jeremy that. Corbyn even in the the context of the Jeremy Labour Party Corbyn, in the UK. Exactly, exactly, and and all all the, all this is uh, uh, now the campaign against uh, 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 George Galloway. And again, I'm not a fan of George Galloway uh, policy, but I mean, he's a guy who advocate when he was a mayor for the same sex marriage. Okay, and now he he come and say, yes, I'm keep. I am, I am, I'm stay supporting same, uh, same uh, sex marriage. I'm not uh, in favor of any discrimination against LGBTQ, but I don't want my kids to uh, to be taught uh, about gender fluidity as a principle uh, or non-binary as a principle of reorganization of society. And then we we have a huge, really huge uh, campaign against him as a homophobic. But, but yeah, and, uh, George Galloway is a whole other case that would require a whole other interview because even Tony Greenstein, for example, in the UK has, who I mean, he's a Jew himself and he's talking about the weaponization of anti-Semitism and he's spoken about how George Galloway has done so well because he's also campaigned on support for Palestine. But there are some problematic issues with his campaign. Some people w- would call him xenophobic, but that's I mean, that would unleash a sort of Pandora's box to, to, to go into the details of, of no, but you're, you're, Talia, 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 why I am, I am raising uh, this issue? Because I think uh, this is why it's so... Uh, now, this is how uh, we live in, in, in this it's extreme polarization. Mm-hmm. And, and, and we label to kill the other. I mean, we label to... Uh, uh, even for somebody... Who, who have a campaign. It's not, he was not uh, a, a lay person. He was a campaigning uh, as a mayor of uh, of London for the same sex marriage. And then we want to disqualify him by homo- homophobic. We need to be very careful, by the way. Again, he may make a homophobic statement, etc. We we should scrutinize it, etc. I'm not defending that. I, by the way, I don't like his politics because... He, uh, he was a complacent with the, with the Syrian regime, which I consider it really the, the dictatorship like uh, Shibli Malat, uh, consider it as a, a, a war crime. Uh, no, sorry, a crime against humanity, exactly like colonialism, if you like. So I'm not a fan of, uh, of his uh, uh, mega politics, but just to say that we need to be careful. And this is exactly how everyone is doing to the other, if you like, and how 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 the media and I I think this is what so uh, uh, disheartening for me to see Liberation Le Monde, which is really part of the left historically, how they they go down and to talk about anti-Semitism of Mélenchon. Uh, it's not only it's not anymore just this uh, politicians uh, uh, the, this. Uh, Politico politician, what we call in the French, of Macron and all this right wing uh, to uh, to use this, but even mainstream media, how how they they went into uh, uh, into this uh, abyss, if you like, uh, of of increasing uh, uh, polarization. This is, if you like, this is how Mélenchon was killed, what, or tried to be killed politically. But of course, not for the lay person. For the lay person, really, they vote for him because he embodied the social justice. He embodied the social justice also for the Palestinians. Something uh, dear to uh, to uh, to French value. I mean, I, I I lived in France for five years. I was uh, I have a lot of. Uh, I was amazed, for instance, uh, in. Uh, in, uh, I'm talking in, in the middle of the 90s when Israel uh, commit a, a massacre in the West Bank or in Gaza, how much you have uh, French people, uh, lay person, go to the street uh, under, uh, under uh, rain uh, to express their indignation. They did it for other issues. It's not for, for that. They did it to uh, 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 also to support 
uh, LGBTQ rights. It's a it's a very interesting. It's a vibrant society, if you like that. That and 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 the media unfortunately play this game. Uh, m- m- mainstream me- media, I'm talking with the right wing and with people like Macron to disqualify uh, uh, the emerging alternative. Why? Why Mélenchon? Because this is the threat. The, the, this is the threat. Why? Why in in Palestine uh, 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 all the time they talk about Hamas because Hamas is a, a, a is a, is important. I, uh, I mean, the demographically, I mean, representing think uh, a national liberation movement is important. This is why we uh, we target it. So, uh, so this is how. And then we create. I'm sorry, who do you mean? But this is why we're targeted. Who, who do you mean by we when you're speaking about Hamas? No, it, it, if you like, it's uh, a. This is, uh, if you like. Uh, uh, here I'm using a little bit of psychoanalysis, if you like. Uh, German, for instance, they they are absolutely uh, guilty of anti-Semitism. They commit the the uh, the unforgettable uh, acts of Holocaust. Okay, uh, of the Holocaust, we agree on that. Now it's a it's really what what they are doing when when the Palestinian when when the migrant came in the nineties, if you like, and come from the Arab countries. So the easy thing is to external uh, to exteriorize uh, uh, the anti-Semitism and say no, no, no. We, it's not us. We we are anti-Semitism. It's them. This is in uh, a, a new comer. Uh, that uh, that uh, the, and so so if you like, this is this is a way of hegemonic uh, uh, a group. If you like, it try to uh, uh, to scapegoat uh, a word you use it yourself uh, to the other. Their their problem and and especially and and this is the same thing that that uh, uh, if you like it's a double mechanism I see in in the France uh, is is the first side is uh, is uh, to say the the problem is not with us uh, for instance in the case of France uh, is that uh, we have a new liberal policy the problem is the migration so if you like is uh, is to throw it there. And 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 second, of course, this is not sufficient. Uh, now, uh, 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 using the uh, the anti-Semitism is more catchy to completely kill the uh, the other. It's always being used as a distraction, and it's good that you brought up the German case because I have a dub a friend who's um, Palestinian, and she was applying for German citizenship, and I think she actually had to mark on her citizenship application that she's. Palestinian, but despite being Palestinian, that she still supports constitutional values and doesn't support any sort of groups that would be at odds with, um, you know, values of tolerance and that sort of thing. So it's automatically, again, conflating Palestinians with Hamas or with groups which target civilians, which and and let's be clear here, um, we should also condemn any sort of acts against civilians that Hamas committed. But, you know, you can d- debate the value of armed resistance against military targets, which many people would say is legitimate. But targeting hib- civilians in any context is never justified. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, I, uh, if you do remember, in in your uh, 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 show uh, uh, a few months ago, we talked about that. Right, and you uh, said the same thing. And, and I put it clearly in my writing that uh, uh, that. But but but, th- but this is a point that that. Uh, uh, we, we need to be uh, 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 very careful how, uh, how, for instance, uh, uh, um, uh, 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 the this discri- indiscriminate attack of Hamas is used to completely disqualify the national liberation movement. Of course, uh, and, and to also uh, distract away from the Israeli occupation and the war crimes exactly, that Israel exactly. is meeting on a daily basis. Exactly. This is what we are talking. Exactly like the same mechanism with Milosho. I mean, the real issues, uh, uh, how to redistribute uh, the wealth in France. And they will say, no, 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 no. The question is not here. He's an anti-Semite. But I mean, just looking at his platform, because Milosho did say that in order to form this left wing alliance, that his party would still be true to its values. So it would be opposed to Macron's pension reforms. It would stand for the right of Palestinians 
to have self-determination and to have their own state, and that it would argue for increases in the minimum wage. And I mean, these yeah. principles seem to be just supporting basic human rights. They, to me, at least, they don't seem like anything extreme. They're not representing a sort of extreme left, hard left, far left. So what do you make of that characterization? I mean, the, you know, the, the media in France is mainly bought by right wing entrepreneurs and is controlled by right wing entrepreneurs. So I think they would like to use that term, the hard left. But is it really the hard left? Yeah. Yeah. You know, a study done in the United States uh, last year, you have 20 people found 80 percent of political campaign. So, uh, and if you look to the media in, in many, many places, and particularly in France, it's really owned by, uh, by lobbyists, if you like. And some of them uh, are uh, pro-Israeli lobbyists. I mean, that people are, are really, they don't care about colonialism. They don't care about the heritage of France in, in, uh, in, in Algeria. They don't care about about Israel and the same logic, if you like that, what the hell? And uh, okay, we substitute a, a a nation by another nation, uh, and and so what? If you like, this is so so uh, so this is this if you like what outraged me. This is this is what uh, my my book about uh, to say to say there there is a portrayal of liberal values. I mean, Macron showed the political liberal values. I mean, this is what is common between Macron and me and you is the liberal values. I mean, uh, remember, let's uh, remember what is liberal, uh, that freedom of expression, freedom of religion, freedom of assembly, uh, um, freedom of uh, private uh, property, things like that. So so this, there is a betrayal when when we say you are, uh, we always, we talk about what we call negative liberties. It means uh you tell ya, uh, 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 nobody will let force you to do something you don't like. Okay, so very simple. I, I leave you alone. I mean, this is negative liberties. Yeah. I mean, you do whatever you want. Uh, uh, now you have a a, a haircut, uh, as, but we never talk about positive uh, uh, liberties. What is positive liberties? Is that we enable you to politically participate. Uh, in the decision making of your of, of your uh, uh, of your quarter of your home uh, uh, against the patriarchy uh, uh, in your uh, uh, in, in your city in in in, uh, in this there is no political participation as far as uh, the political parties are funded by twenty people in the United States. Okay, and the Trump. Uh, uh, be able to be the first, uh, I, I mean, the candidate in Republican parties because behind them is uh, is a multi uh, uh, million dollar of campaign paid by these lobby, lo lobbies. This is, if you like, what what uh, what is going on now. So it's absolutely against uh, political uh, uh, participation. And again, I am not. Uh, YouTube, uh, utopian. Remember the uh, Seattle uh, um, uh, voucher program. Have you heard about uh, uh, Seattle? Uh, it's called uh, Seattle uh, Voting Voucher Programs. They, uh, the, the municipality of Seattle, they allow uh, every they they uh, they mobilize three million dollar. And allow all citizens eligible for for voting in uh, in Seattle to uh, to pay hundred uh, to to have a voucher of hundred dollars to give it to any candidate they want. And you know this revolutionized the representation of the 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 municipal council of Seattle. Suddenly you have more colorful, more gender parity. Uh, 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 a more lower class people become part of the council. Okay, so so there is no miracle. I mean, you can do it, and and as far as you don't do it now, is uh, liberation bought by a, lo a lobbyist 
Lomond has another lobbyist. Uh, Le Figaro is another. They uh, they decide easily to to Mélenchon that should be portrayed as anti-Semitic, and this is how he become he he become uh, 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 like known by this, which is absolutely not true, as you said. Right, and it's good that you mentioned the the positive obligations that a liberal democratic state has, because again, the state is not just there to ensure that people don't harm each other or that their rights are not trampled on by others, but they have a, a positive obligation to create spaces for people to participate in politically so that there's freedom of speech, as you mentioned, freedom of assembly, freedom of religion. These are positive obligations that the state has to ensure that these rights are actually something that can be acted upon or, or that can be expressed. And so it seems like the Seattle case is an example of the state enforcing its positive obligation to try to bring people from various backgrounds into the political sphere and to get them to participate. I, I, exactly. Yeah. All right, Sanjay Anafi, it's been really great speaking to you. Thanks so much for all your time. That was really a fascinating discussion. So thank you so much for your time. Pleasure, Talia. And thank you for watching TheAnalysis.News. If you'd like to support us, you can go to our website, TheAnalysis.News. Leave a comment if you like, and see you next time. Thank you.